Okay. Okay. So uh, I want to just set the context here. So as we, as you guys know, we were one of the first to say, you know, scale out, leaf spine, fixed form factor. You know, Gartner validated all that yeah, innovation. We said. The door off. Huh? Could you take the door off so I can actually? Yeah. Block Nathan's view. And and we were the first. So it's been now three years, and so. <clears throat> What we want to introduce at Interop is our next generation of spine and a controller that manages the fabric uh, in an automated way beyond what Jay showed you. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have Amit talk. Thanks, guys. Uh, my name is Amit. Uh, I'm the second Amit at Dell. Uh, I'm also director of product management here at Dell. I'm responsible for data center networking, more on the fabric side and FTOS, the software side as well. Um, what I want to do today is, uh, is talk to you about uh, some innovation we are doing in, on the fabric side, on the, uh, on the aggregation and core switching side. Um, we introduced a, um, the sort of the first fixed form factor switch in the industry about three years ago, where we did a product which was 2U and had 32 ports of 40 gig. Uh, that time there used to be chassis that used to do 128 ports of 20 gig uh, or 10 gig in 2RU. And we sort of compressed it down to 2RU. And our thinking was, well, Leaf and spine is the way networks will get built, the fabrics will get built. Why? Because traffic patterns have changed. From predominantly being north-south, we see them east-west. Servers need more collaboration, you need more bisection bandwidth, and costs have to come down. 40 gig has become a reality. 40 gig prices have come, come close to 4 by 10 gig. So it's not enough to just have a leaf spine architecture. What we need is products that are optimized for leaf spine. And so Z9000 was our first product we did three years ago, 2RU, 32 ports of 40 gig. That has now become the next generation top of rack, which was the S6000. But what we did was, in the spirit of force 10 networking, we said, well, what can we do, which is 4x the density of the Z9000, 4 to 5x, still line rate, has the lowest latency in the industry, and can have at least 128 ports of 40 gig, line rate, <coughs> or at least 512 ports of 10 gig. And that resulted in this product. So this product is 132 ports of 40 gig line rate. Or you can realize uh, 528 ports of 10 gig. This is the product. This product is currently in trials. A number of customers, uh, we haven't launched it. We launch it uh, uh, externally in about uh, six weeks or so. But there is there are sort of a few pieces of innovation here. Our last product that we did, the chassis-based product, had about 10 microseconds of latency. This is two in the worst case. So latency down by about a fifth. Uh, power is four and a half watts per 10 gig port. Our previous generation used to be about 10 to 20 watts. So an order of magnitude almost or uh, you know, reduction in power and latency. This is the first switch in the industry which will have pay as you go pricing model. So 132 ports of 40 gig, you know, for large data center networks, large cores, yeah, makes sense. Uh, what if I'm a small customer? I don't need everything on day one. So this tiered pricing on the same hardware. The same switch will be sold as a 36 port switch, an 84 port switch, or 132 port switch. Another piece of innovation. Well, I have 40 gig ports and 10 gig ports. What if I want to connect a one gig server to this? Or I have one gig in a, in a PDU. My, my uh, management network is one gig copper. We designed a cable that can take 40 gig, QSFP on one end, RJ45 on the other. So this product can do 40 gig QSFP, it can do 10 gig, it can do 1 gig copper, it can do 1 gig fiber. So this is like almost every kind of 1 gig, 10 gig, 40 gig, multi-mode, single mode, short reach, long reach connectivity that you can imagine is supported in 3RU line rate. So in Force 10, our principle was, well, when we build a product, it has to be line rate. You cannot have 512 ports of 10, of 10 gig in a chassis, claim 512, but does not have line rate performance on it. And we, what we did was we shrunk that down to 3RU. Two microseconds of latency, 600 nanoseconds in the best case, less than five watts of power. And this product also has rapid rails. So in order to install it, deinstall it, the force chain racking technology is supported on this as well. And this has full distributed L2, L3 switching available inside it. So what we have done is not just scale the data plane and have 512 ports of 10 gig, but it has distributed com 
CPU architecture inside it as well to scale the control plane. So I can have as many number of BGP sessions, OSPF sessions, my MLAC can scale as I scale the data plane. And let's see how we are going to sort of use it in, in, in data centers. Uh, the, uh, yeah. Okay. So the use case for this is, I can really build three kinds of fabrics with it. I could build a very small micro scale fabric. I can use the pay as you grow pricing model to do that. You know, 36 ports on, enabled on the switch. I can build say 10, 15, 20 racks with this. And if my needs grow, I can you know, download a software license from Dell.com, enable 84 ports, enable 132 ports. So really pay as you grow to ethernet switching. Second, I can build macro scale fabrics, meaning I don't have 100,000 servers like a, a Google or a, a Amazon or Microsoft data center would have, but I have an HPC cluster, which could have you know, somewhere like 5,000 servers. I can use two of these devices and build a fabric. But I think the most important thing is I can reduce the oversubs down. Oversubs have been around 8 to 1 to 10 to 1 in the past couple of years. With the Trident 2 top of rack products, you can now have 3 is to 1. You can even have 1 is to 1. You could build non-blocking fabrics. But if you go down on oversub, it puts a lot of stress on the core because now there are a lot more number of 40 gig port ports into the core. So you need boxes that can take those 40 gig ports, but with higher density boxes and, and reduced form factors, what you could do is you know, have lower latencies, but aggregate just a lot of 40 gig links with two switches. So this is sort of where we are, and hyperscale is where we promote the leaf and spine design, because that's where when you build it with these kinds of products, which are lower in cost, lower in power, lower in latency, they're very disruptive to hyperscale designs. Hyperscale meaning north of 10,000 servers. And that's where you know, a lot of force gen gear has been deployed, is in hyperscale design. It traditionally used to get deployed in you know, two boxes in the core and you know, build some kind of a factory. Now our factories are basically supporting scale out. Meaning you can have a lot of these, full bisection bandwidth, one is to one over sub, line rate performance, and using cheap 40 gig technology. So 40 gig technology is n just not you know, multi-mode 300 meters, but we have now silicon photonics applied to our optics transceiver modules as well. So we can get lower cost and same reach as multi-mode today. And we have the technology available today on this product. So this product supports long reach over single mode, supports parallel single mode, it supports short reach over 40 gig, it supports copper breakout. So connectivity wise, very rich product. Okay, and let's just quickly go through what we can do. But for our smaller mid-market customers, less than 1500 servers, the way we are going to sort of migrate the market is from Trident family of products, S40 at 10 in the top of rack, and uh, our Z9000 in the core, we're going to go to S6000, Trident 2, top of rack, and this device, the Z9500, with 132 ports, 40 gig in the core. Next one up is HPC clusters and enterprise data centers. I have more servers, more than 1,500. I have, say, 50 racks. But how do I reduce the oversub by half and have twice the number of servers? That's what we'll bring about. And that's very high performance. Reducing oversub requires one generation of silicon technology, and it requires products like the S6000 and the 9500 to be able to support reduce, reducing oversub. It directly translates into improved performance, but it takes maybe two or three years for the industry sort of to reduce the oversub. And now it's even possible to have one is to one if people like to do that. I mean, it's, it's really a, it's a reality this year. And then using 40 gig for hyperscale architectures, what we are doing is we're today promoting only L3 designs because if once you have to go beyond 10,000, it's protocols like BGP that scale very well with route reflection technology for both IPv4 and V6. So that's sort of our architecture for the largest data centers like the Amazons, Googles, and um, you know, yeah. Microsofts of the world. So uh, let me pause here uh, and take any questions. Um, you can have a visual sure. sort of look at the product as well. Uh, it's in trials uh, with a few customers right now. We expect to launch it in the summer of this year. So it's not so it's not actually hardware modular. It's just license upgradable. It's license upgradable okay. using software licenses. Okay. It's still the best of I would say fixed form factor and chassis. Right. right. Okay. Guess. Yeah. You said the the smaller yeah, anything except for this design is uh, this design is where where you recommend layer three only. You did mention there was a full featured data center switching software feature set. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. yeah. So the thing is, this design or the previous design, you could do this this design with L3 also. Mm -hmm. So this is, when I said full feature, what it means is it has full featured 
uh, multi-chassis lag capability, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and you can expand it from two to four, start cascading our multi-chassis lag technology. You can build a b pretty big fabric out right. of it, right? Uh, at, this, at, at some point, you run into limits of ARP tables. That's when you need to create islands. So you need to keep that into consideration. That's always the limit of the cell. Yeah. So well, this is... How, how do you accomplish your multi-chassis yeah. lag? Do those two switches manage as one? Or no. So there are sort of two schools of thought in the industry. Uh, multi-chassis lag with single brain, multi-chassis lag with dual brain. Well, our technology is multi-chassis lag with dual brain. Both data planes and both control planes are active at the same time. So if VRRP is running, both VRRPs are active at the same time. Even for multicast, PIMDR, both of them are acting at, active at the same time. That's our school of thought on uh, multi hey. But you're but doing so L2, no, sorry, you're doing ahead. a bunch of L2. So with this design, you're still doing L2. So you're doing... Correct. LA, you can have servers Correct. with the traditional Correct. LACP, Correct. and you can have VLANs extended across the core using some sort of L2 Correct. pathing, because this is fat tree at this point. This is factory at this point. Factory. Yeah. It's not L2 ECMP. Correct. It's not Trill. It's not SPB. Correct. It's, it's not SPB. No, not, none of that. Correct. Correct. Yeah. The question you but had. But you don't need it because the box is so large, right? What's that? You don't need ECMP at this point because you've got 132 40 gig ports. See, ECMP we use extensively in these kinds of designs. Yes. And the reason is, see, there you are scaling out. And there, um, to your earlier question about ECMP, to really get to the scale that you know, larger cloud data centers wanted to have in a cross design, um, we, uh, we extended ECMP to support 64-way. Yeah. Traditionally, the industry had 16-way, and uh, we, ex we had to extend that to 64-way. Yeah. Very recently, with the Trident 2 family, we also added flax hash capability. Okay. So non-standard IP fields, uh, for instance, NG NVGRE needs non-standard um, uh, fields for hashing, or Rocky needs non-standard fields for hashing. That capability is, is available in our arts as well. Only the Trident 2 family, because it's a function of the silly. Yeah, you can write the device driver to flip the bits on the... Correct. Yeah. That's correct. Sure. Okay. So I think that's it. Any other questions? Uh, now this will be FTOS only? Oh, this is FTOS only, okay. correct. <laughs> yeah. And, and it will be at interop if you guys are there, you know, with any other things, but you're the first ones. Would love to, you know, when we are done here, would love to have any input from, you know, you if we need to emphasize a certain thing or not. Because I tell you, from my perspective, there's nothing in the industry like this for the next one year, okay? No, from none of the competitors, right? And I think we want to make sure that we, we utilize that leadership on innovation, right? Because it's very complex designs and the engineering guys have worked really hard on that. So I want to make sure we get yeah. input also. Let me ask this, you, um, uh, you, you, ran, you rattle off a bunch of you know, fiber options there, right? So Arista and Cisco both came out with like the, you know, the, some sort of like a, a more fiber efficient way to do 40 gig over multi-mode. Was there something yeah, like that fiber, in there? Fiber tray, oh, yeah, talk that about is correct. Um, so there are, um, so Cisco has announced availability of a module called a Cisco 40 gig by die, right. which is basically using existing, you know, two fiber infrastructure to run 40 gig. Right. Uh, we are looking at supporting that similar kind of technology, not okay. the same uh, in the future, but we want to optimize the, the power on it. Uh, Cisco's is sort of high power approach of doing it. Mm -hmm. We'll probably cut down the power by half and also improve the reach. The reach is currently what the support is 100 meters. So we, in the spirit of force chain again, we're trying to go after 300 meter reach and half the power. So once that is available, we'll introduce the product. But, but you're working on absolutely, that. Absolutely, yes. Okay. What was the driver for that cable assembly? I'm trying to imagine who wants to hang a one uh, gig server off of a four of, gig No, not one gig switch. server. The driver was this. Uh, a lot of times you have <laughs> PDUs in the rack. Mm -hmm. And a lot of customers monitor the PDU. You know what's the interface on the PDU? 100 meg copper. Yeah. This cable supports 100 meg copper, not just one gig copper. And that was the driver. This has no native 10 GSFP plus. In fact, in future, this is just 40 gig. 100 gig interfaces will have CFP2s or QSFPs. How do you get 10 gig out of it? One, there's part of the industry which is not moving fast enough. PDUs is one of those. They are at 100 meg today. And you still have to monitor those. That resulted in this innovation. It's not rational, Ethan. It's, it's not rational. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, I, I gotta let it go. <laughs> you let it go. Remember, there's a CCIE out there who doesn't know the future. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll want one gig in there, mate. I'm he'll glad want one I gig, could, and it won't be any good I if it doesn't. I could things up. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Okay. So, so that's the end. So Thank my, you very much, you. guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm at the AFC. AFC. Yeah. Is the suggestion there that we would be connecting a PDU to this 
massive you, core you, device? You, you or? usually indirect somewhere. Yes. Yeah. You know, supplying power. But a lot of times you want in band management of the of the PDU to take statistics out of it. So I mean I have that problem all over the place in server racks. Yeah. But you know, for the one point in the core where I have a PDU I <laughs> Could probably find well, another way. The problem not didn't start here. Problem started on the S6000 product. That's where we really had the problem in the top of rack. Every rack had that issue. Got, so is that cable? Yes. S6000 also. Yeah, yeah, that's where it started. Got it. I think mean, the innovation here is you know what our competition did. They went and redid the box, put the one gig ports, and did it by six months. So we didn't do that. We ended up innovating on the cable. That's very true. Right? This was done without respinning the box and building a new hardware. I have a quick question, and I don't know if you can answer it, but back to the whole port cost, you can ramp it up as you go. What's the entry for this box? Oh, wait. No optics, no nothing else. What's that? No optics, nothing else, just the entry port count. So the, the entry box. port count is 36 ports of 40 gig. That's the entry port. The next step up is 84. Okay, I get that, but what's yeah, the cost? The Oh, so today we haven't, um, so in terms of pricing, uh, we're trying to price the product, at, you know, at what the market can bear, but uh, the current thinking is $2,000 per 40 gig port for the 132 port config. I think it, it, we're list price starting at 136000 136000 yeah, roughly, for the lowest end config. Yeah. All right, cool. It'll be, in, in the true Dell manner, it'll be competitive on a per RU, per port, per watt, for whatever. <laughs>